Hello again, everybody. This is James Bartley, and you are listening to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Today, my very special guest is a dear friend of mine, Naomi Swan. Naomi Swan has the uh, very informative website, EmbodyEnergeticEcstasy.com. Naomi has been in the field of energetic healing and therapy and teaching people to reintegrate and heal for many years now, and she has helped me tremendously on my own uh, journey of personal growth and personal healing. Naomi is going to talk about her newest article, Choosing the Hero Within. Uh, it's a very important topic. Here is Naomi Swan. Uh, no Naomi, how are you doing? I'm good, James. How are you today? I'm doing fine. Uh, we had our uh, de jure uh, artificial alien intelligence interference prior to coming on the show today. It seems that whenever I, I try to have uh, Naomi on, either uh, individually or have her on as part of a panel discussion, all kinds of alien artificial intelligence interference erupts, and so we have to kind of do the song and dance to get everything back on track, but we've done that, and here we are. Uh, your your newest article, which I, I read and really enjoyed, Naomi, uh, could you explain what you mean about uh, choosing the hero within, and how that su this subject has relevance to a lot of people on this uh, the spiritual journey we're on. Well, I think that the hero archetype is one of the most deceptive archetypes out there, and I think that we all wear them, we all wear it more than we think we do, and it's because on some level we are innate healers, but we don't need to do anything. But the ego that is the hero archetype on the outside is very programmed and conditioned to think that we do. And so what happens when the hero archetypes interferes with other people, other people's healings, what happens is that causes interference and then it becomes parasitic, codependent with both parties. And I know within myself I had to go through some huge learning curves in my own codependence and my own hero archetype to understand how it all operates within the, the, the virus and the parasites so that I don't get infected nor do, nor do I infect anybody else. And I think that there's so much out there where people don't see and understand how the mechanism works, especially with um, our relationships and then a lot of healers out there that don't even understand that this mechanism is running. Yes, and for the benefit of the listeners, when Naomi refers to the, the virus and the parasites. She's referring to these archontic manifestations of, of interference, which has been described in some circles as, as like a hive mind parasite virus, a parasite, a form of alien artificial intelligence that works through people, works through entities, works through inanimate objects even, uh, and certainly works through electronic circuitry and, and whatnot, manifest in people's lives for purposes of disruption and, and, and interference. Could you explain the dynamics, uh, Naomi, which compel people to choose to play the hero or, or heroine, which in practice means not necessarily acting in one's own best interest. It's, it's a form almost of self-denial. Um, it is a form of self-denial because what it is is we project out with external validation it's something, you know, it's basically the Superman, and Superman needs to, to, be the, to, to be the savior, or then damsel in distress comes into play. And so with all these different, when you start seeing all these different identities play out, we can start to see the clothing that we've all worn, and we, ha we haven't known that. And I know within my, my own life, you know, I had to, I, I made the setup of this dynamic with my husband and my partner because I hit a point in my spiritual revelation where I was asking for purification of what do I need to do. And then the next thing I know, you know, my husband's coming to me telling me he doesn't want to be with me anymore, that he wants, to, you know, to be separated. And I, I blew, I mean, I just kind of blew a gasket because I was kind of operating on him being the hero when I was damsel in distress. And um, so it was a little bit, you know, trying for me. But the more I sat with it and thought, okay, I'm going to sit with this energy and be with it and feel the fear of it, I, I was able to 
move through it. And I think that's the biggest thing that we don't understand. I think so many of us want to run from it. We want to escape from it. We want to avoid it. We want to drink it. We want to eat it. We want to do whatever we want with it instead of be with it. And when we're with it, what happens is those programs start to dismantle and they don't become us anymore. And when they don't become us anymore, our true essence comes to light. And then we have the organic hero within that becomes the true essence. And then there's no need to be a hero because that identity is dissolved. And what are the hero characteristics or heroine characteristics uh, to which you were referring? Well, I think there's a, there's a lot of different characteristics, and they all interface with each, with each other, you know, so it's kind of like the computer interfacing with different programs. And so, you know, I think one of them is, you know, you need that external validation. So when you're with somebody and they're either trying to make you wrong or they have the superior running or they, they don't respect what you have to share, you know, on their side, they're, on their side, there's a hero running because they want to be able to step in and save you. And they can't save you if, you have, if you're already saving yourself. So there's this trip. It's, a, it's a, what I call a trip in the, in the ego. And so that's what I've seen with different, with different people um, that I talk with or when I do sessions, I see what's going on in the dynamic or even in my own relationship with different people. There's just a, an interesting um, gratification that they need. And that's okay. We need to understand that because we're all running the same thing. We're all running that same, that same program because we were so co programmed and conditioned that way, especially as children, because we've got to, we've got to look at the movies of, you know, the, the prince saving the princess and all these different dynamics that were continually programmed within our mind thinking we need to be saved. I mean, I, when I was doing some research earlier, and I'm going to post this on um, my Facebook page because I thought it was very interesting. It was about a man that said, you know, well, who made, you know, little girls pink and little boys blue? Who, who, <laughs> who thought that one up? You know, where did this come from? Because if you look at that, that's another program. You know, when you really start to look at, when you start to uncover this stuff, we start seeing the programs. And, and just as I say that to you, James, what happened to you? Because, you know, I'm reading you a little bit as I do this, if you don't mind. But what happens is you just opened up and just let some, let some energy release, which is really good. You know, so that, that's what this is all about, is releasing the energy of where the programs have held us and used us as our own weapons. I've seen how this has played out in my own life, too, in the virtual reality uh, scenario known as Facebook, where I would see one of my female Facebook friends being trolled or harassed by some male, and then I would jump right in and have to be the hero and... and uh, you know, lambast the guy for saying all these things to this woman and and validate and uphold her as being a sovereign individual in her own right. I, I didn't realize at the time and, until you pointed this out to me that that in itself may have been a way of invalidating her, ironically. Um, yeah, because, you know, again, this is part of the program and this is what we all do. And to me, it's called, for myself, and I'd like to do a blog on it one of these days, is is called for me it's energetic integrity and it's about knowing that the person is capable of doing it themselves that yes. we don't that we don't need to step in when we can be there in that center and know that is when things are going to change what happens though and how we're all conditioned and you know again this isn't a judgment this, I'm coming from compassion because I was totally conditioned this way coming from alcoholic parents and so when we're all conditioned, what happens is we want to step, project out, try to keep peace in the family. And as we keep peace in the family, what happens is we are projecting out, we're interference, and then we're causing a rift raft, really, because we're actually using our energy systems to enable everybody else. Because now everybody else is at peace, but at our expense. Yes. You know, and so I know I've had to learn this a very, very hard way 
So that is one thing that, you know, when we understand this, it's, it's like our energy system is like giving an alcoholic a drink. We have to stop this. As codependents, as caretakers, and as heroes, we need to stop doing this. And when I went into the relationship with Rick and Jason, what I realized is I knew what I was getting myself into. I didn't go in this double blind. You know, I had one blind eye. I'll, I'll admit that because I knew I had to uncover the other eye. And I wanted to. I wanted to because I knew this was key factors, key information for not only myself but the collective. And so, so Jason and I had a conversation before we entered the relationship. Of course, we all three did. But, you know, when Jason and I were thinking about committing and stuff and working together, you know, Jason warned me. And he said, you know, I'm a dark player out there. And, you know, I was in my Pollyanna New Age crap. And I'm like, oh, come on, you know, I can help you. I can save you. I, you know, we can, we can work through this. And really, you know, he was being really honest with me. When I, when I look at it now, eight years later, you know, he's, he was right. He was a dark player. Yet, what was so great about it and the setup that I set up, or the three of us set up really is I was able to go through that relationship with him and with Rick and get my power back from these two because I know in other lifetimes I gave my power away to lot, a lot to them being the hero and the enabler I was that because of the safety mechanism that was created with Rick um, it was I was able to stretch my wings and be okay in rooted into safety because that's what we need from the inner child to look at the hero, to understand the hero, to understand the codependency. And so I had already seen it with Rick and I had removed and cleaned up a lot of that layer already. But my spirit was ready for a new layer. And Rick didn't hold that layer that I needed from from Jason. And that was the predator layer. And so with Jason, you know, bless his heart with um, telling me he was dark, giving me a heads up, and then me walking into it, you know, understanding that was what was going on, really gave me the hindsight to understand where all the programs and the applications were playing out in my field in order to take my power back, get the virus cleaned up, and, you know, lock those doors. And so that's basically what happened in that dynamic. But the cool part is, is I learned so much about all three of us, and we all did. Because when you're in this dynamic and you have three people, I don't know if, if you remember this when you were younger, but I know when, when, when girls have three people, there's always one left out. And, yes. you know, and that's kind of what the dynamic was in this relationship. You know, if it wasn't Rick feeling left out, it was um, Jason feeling left out. And sometimes it was me feeling left out, too, because, you know, they would kind of gain up on me sometimes. But, you know, that was okay because when that was happening, their hero was coming out, and we all had to go deep inside and re do some reflection and go deeper than most people understand because po most people just want to be in their comfort zone and not do work. And this relationship really put us all three out of our comfort zone. And when you're out of your comfort zone, what happens is it opens up different formalities that wouldn't have, that wouldn't have opened. And so to me, it was kind of like I really felt like it was an energetic workshop that was free, that didn't cost me money, that cost me um, didn't cost me money, but I regained a lot of power from it. I regained a lot of richness from it. I regained my gold back that I had lost from past lives. And that's from me, me entertaining my own hero within. But what I saw is how I projected out how I wanted, you know, I didn't have Rick to save me, so now I wanted Jason to save me on some level. And that really stirred up the false god light that I had, you know, running behind the scenes. And, you know, and then I could see where they wanted me to save them and where I played the superiority and I played the teacher and, you know, and I was in my ego. And so I think that, you know, it's, it's a balance. And I think that right now the planet is trying to find the balance with the masculine and the feminine. And I think that with the hero, 
is they don't have the boundaries. They lose balance. They lose themselves. It's really, really sad when we give up our needs, and that's the hero. That's what the, you know, the ego hero does is they give up their needs to save everybody else. And then that's when it gets really toxic. That's when it goes into, you know, resentment and those kind of, you know, those kind of um, formalities that kind of the entities start coming in and the interdimensional beings ride on them and piggyback on them. And then the whole thing turns into a nightmare. But when we, but when we have the ability to look at ourselves and own and be accountable and humbled, that's when things shift and that's when things change. But it's having that understanding of having that capability of holding and sustaining the field why people go through that and we did that for eight years and we really we really held it and we got really really deep and really sustained the field until it got a little bit too much for Jason and I because we were going so deep what happened is and I want people to understand this because this is where we're going is we were bringing up you know pretty purification energy from the planet and the more purified we were getting, the more the dark forces gained on us. Until finally, we just got exhausted. We were just like, God, this is just getting too tired. We need to take a break. And so basically, that's, that's kind of how it, it ended up. But, we, but I know, I, I can't speak for Jason, but I know I received a lot of um, information. My energy system, I felt like, was so entangled with the both of them. And I couldn't, I felt like I couldn't do anything without a man program. And now it's like, no, I don't need a man. I am so sustained. I don't need anybody. I love being with myself. You know, so it really, really helped me reorganize my system into my own true sovereignty. Those are all very important points. And it ties into this patriarchal programming that all people in general are subjected to, but women in particular, where they're they're force-fed this notion that they're they're helpless, that they need a man or males around to help them resolve whatever crisis, and this is constantly reinforced. We see this also in the in movies where th this hero heroine notion plays itself out. Uh, from the feminine perspective, you have Sigourney Weaver battling all the aliens in in, in that series of movies. You have uh, Kevin Costner in the Postman, a movie in the Waterworld movie, where they're constantly trying to help others, but there seems to be this underplay, this undercurrent of them trying to find themselves at the same time. And, and I've seen this dynamic at work in, in the UFO field where somebody takes on the mantle of being a, let's say, a UFO group facilitator or a UFO support group alien abductee support group facilitator. And they get so busy getting people involved in abductee support group meetings and getting into people's lives that they wind up becoming enmeshed with those people. There's no longer any separation or any boundaries. It's no longer Sheila, the abductee support group facilitator. It's Sheila getting into the kitchen of Millie, of Stan, of Fred, of Lacey. It suddenly, uh, Sheila is is a constant in everybody's lives and there's no longer any separation there's no longer any boundaries uh, and if the person Sheila in our example is under some kind of malign influence or may even be a host for a non-human entity this provides fertile ground for all kinds of intrigues all kinds of mischief all kinds of gossip and rumor mongering and I've seen how one person who maybe at a conscious level wanted to be a facilitator to help others going through the alien abduction uh, experience suddenly became a bane uh, in the existence of all these different people because they simply could not shut off the tap. They were always at, at full kind of force mode, constantly in everyone's life, constantly in everyone's space. So I've seen this personally. Right, and I've I've even been, been guilty of that too. I mean, I'm right now going through, um, you know, I would say, you know, doing my own test drive with that because my issue is I see energy so clearly and so deeply that I can share it with people and 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 let them save face for later. But whenever I do that, I've gotten whacked pretty good. 
So now it's like my higher self is saying, no, if you're not doing that. And then the other day that was so fascinating to me, I had a really cool experience with some, you know, opportunistic um, people. And the opportunistic people, what I see is very fascinating because the ego hero mirrors the opportunistic. And the reason why is because the ego hero is needing that validation or that superior or that exterior exterior need, okay? The opportunistic knows that, and there's an instinct, so they come together as a magnet to go into the push polar feed, okay? So knowing that, that the ego needs that little feed, um, they will attract the opportunistic. In the opportunistic, what happens is they are the people that don't want to pay, that don't see the value, that come in just when they need a little bit of information and then fly back out. You don't hear from them again. You know, it's those kind of people that we all know because we've all done it too. You know, I'm not saying I haven't done it either. I had to go through that experience to understand it because, again, we've been programmed. So um, with that opportunistic, it's fascinating when I start cleaning that up and seeing that, what happened, and I'm not kidding you, I mean, I think that as we deepen and we see more and we clean up these identities, I saw the swarm of, of parasites. I mean, and they were a swarm. I just saw Star Trek the other the day, the movie, and it literally looked like the swarm. And when I saw that swarm, and I saw that swarm around those people, and that they were trying to jump in, it was a group of people that wanted me to do a group for free, I saw the swarm, and I just went, whoa, no way. And I was so able to make a boundary. I said, no way. So I had to look at that. But the cool part is, it's because I had been working on not being, a, not being the ego hero, looking at it, listening to people. If they, if they wanted feedback, they could ask. If they didn't want feedback, I wouldn't say anything. So I was really, that was my boundary. I was just really kind of filling it out, filling it out, filling it out. And as soon as I worked that energy with myself, then that's when I saw the parasites. What I know, how I know it works now, is if I would have plugged in to that opportunistic group for hero gratification, I would have got slammed again, and I would have been what I think some people call a target. Well, we're actually doing it to ourselves, but we don't know it because all this stuff is cutting-edge information. All this stuff is new, and that's why we're doing these shows so that we can keep, the, as we maneuver through the energy, we can all share our experiences so that we can understand what the codes are and how to uncover them. So, you know, the first code is, is don't give people advice don't, don't tell people anything unless they ask. And then if they ask and you want, it, you want it, um, an exchange, make sure you set up a barter. Or if you're going to do it for service, let them know that. This is a one-time service. Or, what, you know, or, or cash exchange. Whatever it is, make sure there's value on it. Because if there's not, it's opportunistic. That's all I'm saying and that's what I see. And it's not pretty. And we need to change the game. We need to. And it's just like, that's how come, you know, I called it a supportive, in the blog, I called it, you know, a supportive monogamy relationship. And that's because that's what it was. I didn't have, you know, sex with Rick. It was totally Jason only, but Rick supported us. It wasn't, it wasn't the polyamory. I think that's very parasitic. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. I don't feel as a collective to do anything like that. And I think when we are there, we won't even want that at that point. But, the, but with the change in the game as far as the um, supporting each other, because these mind control programs are strong, and we need backup. We need support. And I think that by just us changing the game, it put us into another consciousness. Um, Eckhart totally talked about it once on, on one of his um, talks I heard him say. And he says, any time we do something different and we change the game, we, become, we get out of that consciousness, which gives us more ability to do the inner work that we need to do. And we're not bogged down by collective interference. And I think that that's really, really true. I think we go into another gateway, and we, we move a lot more energy that way. So, you know, and moving a lot of energy 
may sound like work, but we've got to understand, you know, the end game. The end game, are we going to be reincarnated and came, come back here again and do this again? Are we going to finally free ourselves as a species? And, and James, I really don't think too many people are taking this seriously. I mean, I just think that they think they can do their stuff, and um, and it's just it, we we can't. We have to go deeper. We have to get more disciplined within ourselves to create changes in the game, because as we create changes in the game, the consumers are going to have the one that will surprise the Illuminati. Yes, and I can only talk about my personal experience as having been this person in this hero mode where I was such in a people-pleasing, seeking the approval of others mode when I first got into this field. Now, I'd been interested in the subject of UFOs and aliens and whatnot since boyhood, but I, as far as a diligent, active researcher, uh, it began in the early 1990s. And when I joined the San Diego UFO Society, suddenly I was in a field of a lot of like-minded people, and we, we all seem to be sharing the same goals and the same desires and the same dreams. Little did I know at the time just how different some of these dreams and visions were from one person to the next. And in my zeal, in my people-pleasing mode, I, I went overboard. I would spend hours uh, fast uh, duplicating tape recorders, uh, mass-producing uh, audio tapes of lectures and sending them out to people all over the country. I would dupe out um, VHS tapes of lectures and, and documentaries and send them all over the place. And, and sometimes when I didn't have a, a blank uh, to record over or if I didn't have the, uh, a recorder that was working at the time, I would foolishly send out the originals. And um, I mean like originals like Barbara Bartholick lectures and Dr. Carla Turner lectures mm. on VHS, which I never got back oh. because I, I was in such people-pleasing mode uh, to be, you know, making a difference, to be everybody's friend, to be kind of a Pollyanna that I lost myself. And one of the problems that some Scorpios have, I went through this myself, is sometimes we, we suffer from, from a dangerous naivete where we think that because this individual we've just met, and maybe we weren't too uh, adept at discerning energy fields at the time, uh, we think that just because they have similar interests in us that we are exactly the same, that we're motivated and we're driven by the same desires, the same wants, we have the same level of integrity. And boy howdy did I find out that was anything uh, that was not the case, because being in this people-pleasing mode at the time sucked me into a lot of intrigues, uh, like in the example I shared earlier about someone named Sheila, who was based on a real-life person, uh, where Sheila was a UFO group facilitator. She had a number of groups. She had an uh, abductee male group. She had an abductee female group. She had a children's group. And she was getting into everybody's kitchen. This is the term that I used, getting into everybody's kitchen. And I got ensnared in all that. And I got ensnared in all of her intrigues and all of her gossip and all of her rumor-mongering. And suddenly my name was being, you know, dragged through the mud. And it was all because of this people-pleasing need of mine at the time, where I, I had this compulsion to make myself liked and make myself uh, appreciated. Instead of just being me and letting my natural meanness, if you will, flow out, I fell into this pattern, which you're talking about, this, this hero pattern. And, and also I spent a lot, an, an inordinate, inordinate amount of time back then trying to rescue these women that had uh, female abductees, female my labs, that had gotten themselves in all kinds of intrigues and gotten themselves in all kinds of difficulties with, with controlling manipulative males. You know, I would try to step in and, you know, be the hero again, and that just got me into more trouble. And another point you made earlier, which is extremely important, is the importance of setting boundaries. Because when I was in that people-pleasing mode, and, and for many years afterwards, I didn't realize, uh, you know how it is, uh, Naomi, well, when you get so involved doing this kind of work, you forget that there, there is a public image of you uh, where people have this, I, I don't know, perhaps even an idealized image of who they think you are, right? Right. Whereas, you know, we have an idea of who we are, especially after a lot of self-work, a lot of reintegration, and I'm, I'm a, still a work in progress in that regard. And so... When people started coming to me and asking for advice and help, 
I fell into that old people pleasing mode where I would just spend an inordinate, inordinate amount of time um, writing correspondence to people, uh, emailing people, sending them links. By now we're in the internet age, so I'm sending links and, and, and whatnot. And, and I realized, to my chagrin, only much later that there is a parasitic element to this. Mm-hmm. There's a fine line between people wanting advice, wanting some insight. And I right. have no qualms with that because right. I do value the, the interaction, uh, you know, within limits of, of as long as proper boundaries are set up at both ends. Uh, but what I found is that there are people who are contactly manipulated. And sometimes you can even feel it in their energy field when they contact you, either through, the, uh, through emails or through, like, Facebook Messenger or some other uh, means where you immediately feel this this negative energy emanating from them and they ask you all, all, for all this help, all this advice and uh, Evie Lorgan coined a, coined a term, she called it yes but people, mm-hmm. where you spend a lot of time explaining, well not telling people what to do, not even really giving advice but giving people options, okay based on what you tell me uh, this, this, and this. It's it's how you choose to deal with it. And what these people tend to do is, yes, but, and then they go on and on, basically re-manifesting all of the syndromes, all of the programming, all of the hang-ups and in- inward problems they had not re- yet resolved. So they they take your information, they take your help willingly, but within them there is some kind of programs installed installed that make them resistant to accepting any kind of meaningful advice or change and so and what happens sometimes is with people that are like that is the the dynamic changes from you being the hero savior to you being the antagonist right where you know I came to you for help yada 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 and the person is getting manipulated all along and then the manipulation intensifies and suddenly they wake up one fine morning and and you're just the worst thing that's ever happened to them right right Uh, what when at the beginning it was kind of a mutual kind of form of self delusion where i thought maybe i could help this person but really i was being pulled into this this energy sucking uh expensive mental energy a lot of emotion it's ener- energetic harvesting at its worst and and a lot of times these people don't even really want help they've just been kind of sent to you to to kind of like leech off you and parasitically feed off you and so I had to realize that, okay, there's that category of person, and then there are these other people that really would like help. And, the, and for the latter category, once you establish boundaries, right, and you say, okay, well, if, if you want any more, if you, you want to talk about this in depth, then we can set up a consult, then we can set up a session, whatever the case may be, because there has to be a, a certain value ascribed to the information that's being provided uh, to people. Because otherwise, if there's no, whether it's uh, uh, in a broader sense, as you pointed out, or as uh, like a monetary exchange, uh, a cash value exchange, for some people, if there is no value ascribed to the information being provided, they are free to accept it or reject it at will, right? Whereas it's funny how people work. It shouldn't really be that way from, from a mental emotional, spiritual standpoint, but some people are funny about, about it in that way. However, if you apply like a value uh, to what you're providing, then suddenly the person may, may be more reluctant to reject the information out of hand because they've paid for it, you see. Yeah, I think, I think you know, I've, I've really looked at that and I really reevaluated it because I've gone through many, many different doors on this. And you know, at first I was, I was always gave myself away. I always, you know, gave out freely and I was not like you. I was on the phone for hours and I'm not really realizing it. And then as I kind of moved into it and I was putting a lot more money out myself in workshops and just kept, you know, working on my own, my own self. And I was just getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And then I would meet people like you or different people and they would say, do you realize what you have? Do you realize this? Do you realize that? And I wasn't even realizing it because to me, I'm just me. You know, I'm just doing my gig. Yeah. I just want to evolve out of here. I want to jump out of here. I don't want to get trapped in the astral realm. That's my driver. And so, you know, that's where, that's where I have my passion at. And so when that was happening, 
I started I started to reevaluate and going, well, wait a minute, I am putting all this money out in these workshops, and maybe I do need to start looking at this and start charging more, reevaluating. And when I did, what I realized was when I started putting a value on myself, and you know, and I'm not saying like. You know, I don't ask for a lot of money from somebody. If somebody came to me and said, hey, you know, I can, I can only afford this, I would negotiate. I mean, I understand, I understand where people are coming from these days or, you know, how can we change and barter, you know, whatever that looks like. Just because there's, there's for an exchange to happen because then what happens is that person honors themselves, they respect themselves, they feel good about receiving they don't feel that they're parasitic on the other side, you know, and it's an even exchange, and it works both ways. And then, you know, and then me as, as, a, as a reader, you know, I feel good. There's an even balance. It's equality. And we're moving from the me, you know, when you look at the me, the inner child me, is all about me, 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 and my ego needs. Well, now we're moving into the we, and the we is about being uniting creating and how are we going to do this and so it's about you know ending the game like it is and making things different and it's about using our creativity on how to make things different by getting our needs met and on on the the flip side what I love about it is when we're in our organic integrity that the universe will just put it there for you I mean I I know when people come to me it's because the universe put that person there. They that, yeah. that that universe you know, that person needed this information at this point in time. And so, you know, that's just what I'm finding out all the time. My needs are pretty much met and it's the basic needs of you know, of a human being, not the you know, not the the grandiosity need of the out of balance ego materialism that, you know, there's so many people running on that that driver. So, you know, but it's just this peaceful understanding of where we're at in the um, in the give and take, reciprocal, balanced um, relation in relationship with with nature, and it really is it's, it's nature. You know, that's how nature operates, and so it's about us becoming into our organic nature again. And those butt people, I think those butt people are in so much pain and agony that they they are spinning. I've seen this over and over again. They're in OCD loops. And they're yeah. spinning and they're spinning and they're spinning. And they're spinning so tightly that they don't understand that they're they're throwing energy at everything and everybody and they don't understand why people keep, you know, running away from them. And um, you know, because I am so sensitive, I feel it. I mean I feel like I'm being whipped. You know, when I'm in that, when I feel that energy coming in. What I know is this, you know, on it, but with a mother, you know, a mother with a huge heart and a huge understanding is, you know, the, the compassionate intelligence of my essence sees this person hurting. And I also see that their needs are not being met. And probably for their almost whole entire life and past lives, they haven't been, been met. And I think that what where we're moving into is the hero within is understanding the processes of how we meet our own needs, our own emotional needs. I'm not talking about if you're in a wheelchair and you and you have somebody that can't help you because you know you hear this stuff and you're going, oh yeah, great. Well, I can't do that. I'm in a wheelchair. How can I do that? Uh uh uh. I'm not talking about that. We all have physical needs that we need taken care of. That's not, that doesn't go without saying we're here in this 3D world. I am talking about emotional needs that we project out. We want people to meet, just like you, James, you know, that, that person, you didn't meet their needs, and so you became, you know, not the nice guy. They weren't what you thought you were. They didn't meet your, their expectations. They couldn't paras parasite off of you. Instead of them going inside and saying, you know what, I'm going to be okay. I'm safe. It's going to be okay. I can use nonviolent communication, and I use this tool, and I will always, always, always tell everyone to use this tool, to get the book, to read it, to go to groups, to learn it. This is the way out because, 
You know, that's how they control us is through our emotions. And if we don't get a handle on our emotions, then they have a handle on us. And so with the nonviolent communication, it's so easy just to go through that nonviolent communication list and say, you know, I'm feeling shut down, hurt, and I'm just needing to be loved and, and appreciated. And so I think that that is, you know, one of the easiest tools out there that we can do to dissolve the accumulated energy that's in all of our systems. And then on the flip side, you know, with people like me and you and other people, is when those butt people come to us or when we have those butt people in our life, is to use the empathy and just saying, "Are you? Just, do you just need to be heard? You know, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll hear you for ten minutes. So I'm gonna set a boundary, but no, I, I'll hear you for ten minutes because I honor and I love you. And I really think it's about stepping into that next place, you know. And sometimes when we can just do that and hold that space for ten minutes, then they can find themselves. And I'm not going to say it happens a hundred times, but I think as we deepen, um, our unconsciousness clears. We clear. We're, we're, we become a clear vessel. And I, and I think that, you know, I want to talk a little bit of, la you know, layers here because I think that at the highest layer, there is no boundaries. We're pure beings. We're organic. We don't need boundaries because we're so pure. And I think that's where we get confused because I think that we've all felt that. That's really the true hero within. We wouldn't need integrity because we're already in integrity, you see, and we've been there before we got hijacked. But now we're there. We've gone through all this mind control. We've gone through all this. So it's about, okay, what processes do we need to look at to dismantle the energy to stop it? And so that's what we're just going to continue to do is just keep, keep dismantling the energy to look at each one. And what I'm finding, James, and I don't know about you, but it just seems like almost every single time I have contact with somebody, I'm dismantling it just by because I'm so deep inside that I'm seeing that their, their code and it can't plug into me anymore. But the cool part is because it can't plug into me anymore, they're waking up faster because then they'll come to me the next time I talk to them and they've got it figured out. Instead of me trying to, you know, input or whatever, I'll just watch. You know, and nine times out of ten they've got it figured out. So that's been pretty cool to watch too because I think that's what, that's what will happen eventually is, is we go into emptiness. That's what, you know, emptiness means when... Uh, you know, the Buddha talks about enlightenment or, you know, emptiness means, you know, we're hollow. We're hollow inside. And the reason why we're hollow inside is that allows grace to come in and hold the field using our body as an instrument to do the work for us because we've cleared out all of our emotions. And see, that's, that's the biggest key out there that we can do for each other. Well, it does take courage to remove the conditioning and you speak often of, of the ener energetic structure uh, of the patterns in the mind. Uh, you speak of the monkey mind. C could you elaborate on that? Well, I think that as we go through this, we all have monkey mind, and you know, and not in this blog, but the blog before. I talked a little bit about the. I talked a lot about the monkey mind, and I think that as we we understand, I think the biggest thing for us is compassion. Because as we understand the split mind, I mean, Jason, I really got to understand the split mind with Jason. And I got to understand my own split mind with Jason because, you know, I'm just his mirror, right? And so with the monkey mind, it's really understanding that you have this, you know, I'm going to get oh, teary-eyed here. You have this beautiful heart that really wants to come forward and really wants to move in with the energy. And they want to go forward and they want to go deep. And then behind them is the monkey mind. And the monkey mind is the fear, is the, is the trauma, is whatever driver that is. And that's the mind that starts to interfere. And then what happens is the way I see when I, start, when I do readings on people is that monkey mind can, if I don't do readings, if I do readings, I have the ability to keep the, the curtain open. But... If I don't do readings, what will happen is the monkey mind will close the curtain and to their blind spots, and they can't see. 
And then what happens is then they're hijacked, and then they change into a whole other personality. To me, that's shape-shifting. They change into another I, a sub-personality that they don't even know is driving them. But with what, what I have found out, when I'm in my organic stance, my hero within, what happens on my instrument, grace comes out. And what happens sometimes is they'll come out of their spell. They'll just wake up and go, boy, where was I? And so that's really cool when that can happen, but sometimes they don't. Sometimes they're just throwing energy at you. And when you can say sustained, allow that energy to be flipped at you, but you're so strong in your field, they can't. It's just like it just falls off your field. They can't penetrate it. Nothing can penetrate you. That is what I learned with Jason. That's what I got to that point to where I got so strong in my field. So the other day, just as an example, I was talking to a client, and um, she's, a, she's a friend of mine. I wasn't doing a reading on her. And she was talking about punishment. And she basically was upset with one of her family members, and it was her sister. And she basically wanted me to get on the punishment wagon with her. Now, I'm not saying that the, that the sister didn't do what was, was very out of integrity what happened, and I won't go into the story. But what my friend was trying to do was put me in that bucket of punishment with her. And I just, I just got really succinct in my field. And like I said to myself, I'm not, I'm not going to punish. I have no right to punish. That is, not, that is none of my business. That's between them and God. It's none of my business. And when I say it's none of my business and it's between them and God, you know, that just keeps me really tight in my field. And then she says, well, I need to go. And I know why she said that she needs to go is because she wanted to hook in and ride me with, you know, to slam him. See, I see the, how the spell works. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, I'm just not going to do that. Unfortunately, this particular person isn't coachable. So I just, I just don't say anything. And when the door, you know, when, when she, when it, there's a time where she is co coachable, then it will happen. So if it doesn't, that's okay, too. I mean, you know, I don't need the business. So that's where that's at. You know what I'm saying? It's, so you're just looking at all these different dynamics, and there's no judgment here. It's pure observation of knowing what I can do, what I can't do, what they're paying me for, and what I'm allowed to do. Yes, and the point you made earlier also about how – by sustaining our field, we don't become engaged. Uh, we've come across so many people, uh, you and I, they're stuck in these OCD thought loops. And in our example, let's say they're, they're caught up in like a really long-lasting alien love bite, and they're, they're in the throes of an obsession with another person. What I found is if they're in the yes but mode, the best thing to do, as, as you've said, is to give them – Ten, 10 minutes of time, if you happen to be around them, if you happen to interact with them on a semi-regular basis, let them talk about what their, whatever their misgivings are, whatever their thoughts are on the, the toxic relationship they happen to be involved in. Vice, in the past, always coming up with, on our part, coming up with advice, giving them different scenarios and, and, and having them play out different scenarios in their mind if this, then this, what if, etc. Because we find out to our chagrin that often is not, they just reject those suggestions out of hand anyway. So it becomes not only an OCD thought loop for them, but we get pulled into their OCD thought loop and we participate in this game, this dog and pony act kind of, where if one were to step back and look, it would seem as if person A, the one who seems to be seeking advice and help, getting the same responses out of person B, the person who's playing the role of the hero or heroine, and person B's responses are basically being ignored and dismissed and marginalized. Right. And so it, it becomes like, a, like a, a vicious cycle over mm -hmm. and over and over. And I found that when I just allow this person, and it's something that just came to me kind of organically. It, it was not, nothing that I kind of set out to do with certain people. I just said, okay, I'll let them speak their piece because I know at some point they're going to want to bring up this toxic relationship and what they should do about it. I will just let them speak 
and after a certain amount of time, I will I will acknowledge them, I will I will love on them, and then I will kind of change the subject and move on to something else. So they get their needs met. I don't get pulled in. They don't get their hooks into me. I don't spin my wheels giving them advice, which a they're not paying for, b they don't really want to act upon anyway, right? Right. And so it, it honors the both of us. Right. It, it no longer it changes that dynamic from being parasitical right. on the one hand and the need to be a people pleaser, right. hero heroine on the other, right. and it, and it lifts it to a different level. And it's a balance, and it becomes balanced because, you know, just like my friend, you know, I'm honoring her. I'm I know my bound I know my boundaries with her. And so, you know, it becomes this this understanding that's where we're at and observation so that what I know is each mind is different. So that's why the art of discernment is so key. And even when you think you get the art of discernment down, then it comes through the back door again. And so, you know, when one comes through the back door, then you got more on your tool belt. Okay, there now there's this code. Because I don't look at these um issues is the people because I see the people's heart and I real and I know people are very loving and nurturing at heart it's the program and so I just see the program and I just yes. you know, put the program in my pocket and go okay here's another tool that I can watch out for here's another tool that I can share with people so that they understand the program and not get hit by the program like I did or like you did you know what I mean and I think that's what I think I know that's what's going to happen as we move forward you know, I think things are going to move really quick as we dis dismantle these different programs. I mean, there was a uh, a party I went to the other day. One of the things I saw was kind of a I fell into the hero thing again. It was very, very fascinating. Um, a friend of mine was going out of town, and we went to a party. And I, I don't really go to – I don't drink, and so there was drinking there. It w wouldn't be one of my things, but since she was moving, I wanted to go for her. And it wasn't, you know, a big – you know, drunker party. It was just wine and stuff. However, the woman that did the party for her wouldn't let us leave. She wanted my girlfriend to stay another hour, and it's like, you know, 10:30, and I'm looking at my friend. We should go, and she's like, I want to go too. And then 11:30, we're still there, and as I'm noticing, we're still there. You know, she's drinking her wine, and the entities are really starting to get riled up. Mm -hmm. And um, as she's talking, I'm watching. I'm watching the entities now, and she, she, what she's doing to people was very fascinating. She was monopolizing the conversation. Then she, she would come out and ask the person a question. Before the person could answer her, she would move to the next one. So the person was left like, I want to answer you. She would close the door. It would go into a trap door, and so she would actually put their energy into a trap door and then she would go to the next now i was yeah. i was part of the energy i know i was in the trap door till the next day and i saw what happened so you know so the next so the next day i mean it's like you know we get home at 1 30 and i said to my friend and she's also from adult children of alcoholic parents and i says hey i says we really screwed up last night we did not honor ourselves we did not set boundaries. We did, we allowed her to manipulate us, and we stayed there. And she goes, I know, I see that. And we both felt hungover, and neither one of us drank. We felt like we both drank two bottles of wine. I bet you that girl didn't feel hungover at all. It's the old adage, he, who, he or she who asks the questions controls the conversation. So she would throw somebody a bone by asking them a question, then take it away and, and ask somebody else a question. So... It, it was just kind of a game she was playing to maintain control and keep people there, keep people there to sustain her energy field. Very interesting dynamic. It was an interesting dynamic, but, you know, even, even, you know, a, even just a step further, though, she put our energy in a trap door and used it for harvesting. Yes. Now, I was being used. I'm like, where is my energy going? What is going on here? When I got up and I meditated, I could hardly meditate because my head hurt so bad. And I'm like, what's going on? I mean, I and I had a horrible, horrible day. I had to go to the doctors all day. I could barely drive. And, um, you know, I'm a recovering alcoholic, so I know what it feels like to have a hangover. And believe me, that's what it felt like, a double whammy. But then, you know, after I got, you know, my head clear and I was able to sustain my, I'm like, what happened? And my, my spirit showed me this is what happened. This is how snaky and sneaky that is out there. But, you know, 
I was being the hero because I didn't want to, you know, cause waves. I didn't want to make a boundary because it was my friend's party. You know, and look, I got whacked again. So, you know, it's just understanding each situation is different. But as we look at them, we're accountable to them, we're humble to them. We know, okay, when I'm at a party and, you know, the entities come out, I'm out of there. I'm sorry. You know, if people want to drink, I really don't like to subjugate myself to that because I'm a pretty pure filled. I have no judgment if people want to do that. That's their life. I've been there. I've done that. But I really don't want to be around it. You know, that's where I'm at. But, um, but it was interesting. It was interesting to see how they were harvesting. Now, she was a pro. And what was so fascinating is she had a ton of energy, that, that young girl. I mean, not she was our age, she was my age, but she had a ton of energy. I'm just like, well, no, no wonder you got so much energy, you know? They they know how to they know how to use her to harvest and use the energy. So, you know, what I what I did is I entrapped the door and got all my energy back. And as I'm saying this, it's fascinating. Um, the collective is getting their energy back, I think, James, because me and you were talking about it. So it's kind of like all the energy is going back to the collective if the people are aware to get it. So that's fascinating. I'm seeing that on a, a, a level that we're working on. Because we, we work at pretty we work at some pretty high levels, especially together. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we we draw the interests of let's say some unsavory types. But, but the way I look at it is, and I don't want to sound like I'm being the hero here. Uh, perish the thought. But sometimes I think that w when some of these negative archontic entities take some shots at us, maybe just maybe they're easing off and they're not messing with someone else who's a bit more vulnerable, you know, kind of cutting them some slack, you know, because after a while of fending off all these assaults for so long, you build up what amounts to spiritual muscle. It's like spiritual muscle development. Uh, in the time we got left, you make a point about talking about the, the importance of uh, focused awareness, the consistency of maintaining a focused awareness. What do you mean by that as it relates to what we've been talking about? Well, you know, I think this is so, this is such an important dynamic, and I mean, we could do a whole, a whole other show on this, but I think that what happens is when we're not focused aware, so again, I can use myself at the party the other day, I wasn't in focused awareness, I was in, you know, I was worried more about Judy, or, or, you know, my friend, this is her party, she's leaving, I don't want to, you know, bother her, you know, I wasn't in focused awareness, I was allowing that that woman, you know, not answering my questions. I was just kind of out of it. I was tired. And so what I realized is when I'm not in focus awareness is when the parasites come in or the door or mm. the trap doors open. And so, but when I'm in focused awareness, it's intent. The energy muscle is very, very strong. It's turned on. I'm turned on as a, a unit. Um, what happens is... I'm energetically out of the way. I'm not trying to protect. I'm not trying to save. I am speaking my needs. Um, I don't care what, you know, I mean, I care what people think, but it's their perception, not mine. Once I speak my need, once I have uh, a feeling, I know that I can speak it, but how they want to perceive that is none of my business. But as long as I speak it, that's focused awareness. I'm speaking my needs and my feelings. Sometimes, too, I don't even have to speak it to the person. I can just come back and go through my feelings and my needs by myself. That's focused awareness. You know, I think it's, to me, that's when we start becoming multidimensional is when I can, I can be with Rick, and Rick's triggered, and I'm triggered, and I'm saying, I love you, Naomi, and um, things are going to be okay, you're safe, or whatever, because I have a very dynamic code in my trauma where I'm not safe. So, you know, a lot of my, my inner focused awareness is I'm safe, I'm safe, I'm safe. And what will happen is that will set up that boundary so that Rick's energy cannot come in to me. And so I'm, I'm aware. And, you know, it's very fascinating. I don't know if you own animals, but they know when you're in focused awareness and when you're not. Oh, yes. They know because when you're in it, they lay down, they sleep, they're in a meditative state. When you're not, they're all over the map. And so they're kind of another mirror for us to understand where our energy is and the chaos or whatever. So to me, the focus awareness is moving out of the control mechanism, too. Because the hero, the ego hero, they are so much fear 
that they want to control everything and they want to keep everybody at peace. And one of the hardest things I've seen over and over and over again is, is the denial piece. And we'll go deeper into that in the next hour. Because, you know, the denial and the compromise and all these different pieces that happens is that's where those doors open and the parasites come in. And the, the denial is is understanding that they... You know, let's say that, you know, I'm sure we've all seen Dr. Phil, but, you know, that's a perfect scenario, is when he has these shows on and the family is in denial and, you know, in the big dark secret, let's say, you know, there's a pedophile or something in the family and it's a big dark secret and the, the, the mother and father will do everything they can to keep that under the carpet. They will protect that, they will protect that secret, they will protect that secret, even at their expense at their children's expense and why to protect the pedophile because they're sh because of the shame that they're carrying i mean you know this is fascinating when, when we look at all this stuff and see what's really driving the show you know that self-betrayal you know that denial mechanism is self-betrayal so when we can understand our own denial mechanism what are we denying within our own system Man, we have a pocket full of power that's going to come back to us. I mean, I'm not going to say a pocket. I'm going to say a gold mine, you know, because that's where a lot of these, where this organic power is hidden, is in the de denial mechanisms of us being mind-controlled and basically slaughtered on so many levels that when we see the accumulated energy of where we've denied ourselves is when we get a lot of our energy back, a lot of our power back, the organic power back. And that's the that's the mainframe that we want to move into into the organic template. Well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, that is information that is particularly uh, apropos for empaths. There's so many empaths in this field. Those boundaries are not set. If the focused awareness, what the military types may refer to as situational awareness, if it's not there, there's always a possibility that an empath in particular can be hooked into the energ energetic field of someone else going through their own challenges and perhaps even pulled into all these intrigues and, and all these uh, misadventures, let's say. Uh, it's very easy to happen in our field. So we've reached the end of the first hour. You've been listening to Naomi Swan uh, talking about the hero within, and we're just getting started. Uh, in the second hour, we're going to talk about the ways to get out of this hero programming uh, to use a computer term, uh, how the operating programs work and how the viruses are kind of set loose to undermine the pro programming and rewrite the programming to make us more compliant and plugged into this form of self-denial, self-betrayal. Uh, so you've been listening to the Cosmic Switchboard with my very special guest, Naomi Swan. The Cosmic Switchboard show is listener driven and subscriber driven if you like what we're doing here please go to the cosmic switchboard.com and subscribe and be a member and so with that we'll see you at the top of the next hour